now we go to session two. Um, we have uh, energy supply uh, and infrastructure, where which is a base actually for uh, everybody uh, uh, who wants to fly electric. And we had battery supply for years as the main subject. Uh, but we see over the last, let's say, several months, uh, one, two years, there is a lot of people going, a lot of focus now going to hydrogen, to fuel cell technology again, as we see that the battery capacity is not as sufficient for most or for many of the electric uh, use cases. And as hydrogen is also supported now by a lot of governments, by the EU Commission, so I think we can expect perhaps a faster growth. And what we have here is we have uh, different uh, uh, people and different companies which will give us an overview on the uh, different energy supply, which is so important for electric aviation. Our first speaker is uh, Mr. Chai, for CTO from State uh, Power Invest Corporation Limited. The stage is yours. Mr. Chai? Yes, uh, it's yours and you should uh, be presenting. I have to... Well, let me speak in Chinese then. Um, well, I did my studies uh, in Japan, so um, I don't speak quite good English. Let me continue in Chinese. So we are using the hydrogen to pursue our dreams the spic where i come from is one of the key enterprises for hydrogen and two years ago we were working with baic and together with comac beijing to develop our uav power and propulsion system so uh, let me talk about some of our collaborations, especially our fuel cell development using hydrogen and uh, the development with UAV. So I'll be covering three areas. First, the development and prospect of UAV, and the second, the development innovation of hydrogen, and the third is that the development of the fuel cell air-cooled application in UAV. So we talked about the UAV market and in the future we have great prospects for UAVs. And in the recent years, we've seen rapid development. Starting from 2014, we had a 1 billion US dollars. And uh, as of now, it has reached 8 billion. And inside China, we've also had a great expansion. And uh, in China, we are moving toward the international market and our sales to the international market is very large. It is applied in aerial photography, the plant protection for agricultural as well as air defense. But the issue with UAV is that it does not have a long enough durance. And there is also other issues with the height of their flying. So with the development of fuel cell and hydrogen, can we apply those type of energies onto the UAVs? This is something we're looking into. Next slide. For UAV, for fixed wings, uh, rotary wings, they have a lot of edge. So it has a larger payload and lower limit and a shorter period of Durance. And for the fixed wings, it cannot uh, hover with a limit. And for the rotaries, uh, it has fewer limit for different scenarios. It's more flexible. However, it has a shorter durance. So we are looking into the composite wing UAV. 
and we need to solve the issue of it is uh, impossible for the hovering and to solve some of its limits for example for the 480 kilograms and a three to five hours of duration for its flight next slide next slide please So uh, this is what we've most seen of our energy types. We have uh, diesel, lithium battery, and fuel cells. And for the diesels, uh, it's of high pollution. But for lithium, it has a lower density. And for fuel cell, it is biggest characteristics. It is that uh, it is applied onto a lower temperature setting and it has a higher energy density. That means it can have a longer durance or a longer duration. And for fixed wings, we believe we can achieve 11 to 12 hours. And for the rotor wings, it can uh, consist of three to five hours. Working together with COMAC, we developed these two prototypes. One is the fixed wing fuel cell UAV. So it is done in Henan province, uh, Zhengzhou, in two years ago. We had a test flight of around uh, 10 hours. And the other is the composite wing fuel cell UAV. This is something that are still in development for one of these types. We have a 200 kilogram payload and the other type is 480 kilograms payload and using some of their powers they have a higher kilowatt for example for the fixed wings we have 12 kilowatt and for fixed wings we have a higher uh, power next slide next slide please So let me talk about uh, some of the innovations and R&D we have in this area, because SPIC is one of the important energy SOEs of our country. So we want to have a net zero carbon emission and to achieve carbon neutral, to have this clean energy and to be low carbon. And the second is that we want to reduce our reliance on gas and fuel, and we will depend upon ourselves and achieve high efficiency for energy supply. Because for us, we want to be more independent in terms of the fuel cell, including the entire process we need to develop ourselves. And the second is for diversification. In the future, we will have a higher efficient system, including electric and hydrogen. From the state level, we have the renewable energy and it is not stable. So we will store some of the hydrogen. Uh, we can, uh, through the power grid, we can transmit the power into different households and then we can use hydrogen to generate power or we can connect the power generated by hydrogen to the grid. So these are several ways for us to make sure that the hydrogen power and the traditional fossil fuel power can be mutually complemented with each other. This would be a very high efficient power grid system in the future. Next page. All right, so for FPIC, we have a uh, generation of hydrogen, storage, transformation, uh, transportation, and the actual application of hydrogen. We have uh, business in all these four categories. We are one of the biggest, also we are one of, SPIC is one of the biggest uh, PV solar panel in China. And also we can use uh, hydrolyzation and uh, uh, hydrogen production. We have uh, collaborated with Siemens from Germany. Next page. So for SPIC, 
this is our layout for energy markets for the energy categories of we will do renewable energy to come to make uh, hydrogen and and also we want to build our hydrogen supply networks for example we will have our hydrogen station and our distributed energy supplies and when it comes to our product we have our own technology to come out with our fuel cell products we have right now have already designed and produced a fuel cell products that we for demonstration purpose for hydrogen storage for transportation and for distributed power supply next page so for SPIC, we have a very clear cut strategy for our future. For us, uh, we will come up with a platform, integrated platform for hydrogen technology R&D and high-end manufacturers. And also we will become a platform for high-end talents. We'll be the pioneer and pace setter in this industry. The overall goal of our company is to make ourselves as one of the best pioneer of hydrogen technology that have our own tech core technology and our own talents. This is our industry layout in four different regions in Beijing, in Ningbo, in Wuhan. And also we have our frontier technology follow-up platforms in Japan. We have collaborating with Guangzhou and other cities as well in terms of hydrogen technology. So first we try to do R&D on hydrogen fuel cell and also integrate hydrogen powertrain systems for UAV, for other aerodynamic, for, for other civil aviation development. And also we have R&D in hydrogen storage and also secured safety technology research. For core technology, we are doing uh, catalyst research. This is our catalyst durability curve in the, our Japan lab and uh, our durability for our catalyst is one of the best in the world. We also compare our catalyst durability with uh, Mitsushi from Toyota and other commercial products and also our core technology which is our membrane electro technology using our model clamp and also our galvanic pile and galvanic plant a clamp in a low temperature we can actually uh, start up turn on the our products in a very low temperature, meaning that we have high stability of our product. And also for, we can reach nearly 500 milliwatts per cubic per square centimeters. This is one of the best performance because normally you would have 300 milliwatts per square centimeters uh, when it comes to CCM performance. And this is our uh, Beijing lab with a full automation pilot production line for membrane electrode. Next one. In terms of part of R&D, we do R&D in transportation. And also we do R&D in catalyst, gas diffusion layer, proton exchange membrane, and membrane electrode and bipolar plate. So we have two bus. Buses were produced by us in Ningbo city. One is uh, 12 meters. The other is 15 meters, uh, public bus. Overall speaking, this is the portfolio that we have. We have uh, water cool and air cool systems. In terms of the air cool systems, we have an air cooled metal plate fuel cell series with high energy density, with 800, more than 800 kilowatt, more than 800 watts per kilogram. Next one is the water cooled vehicle fuel cell system with also very high energy density. Next one is the air cold fuel cell system for UAV progress. And our goal is to come up with clean, high performance and smart fuel cell aviation systems. Uh, we collaborate with COMAC and uh, uh, for COMAC, they provide us with a fuselage and for us, we provide with powertrain. For example, how can we combine fuel cell with a lithium battery? And uh, uh, we, uh, we are having this very mutual complementary relations. We are doing the power strain, they are doing the fuselage and the avionics. Next one. So 
now these are the two products we have now. First is the fixed wing with a, a maximum uh, takeoff weight of 30 kilograms. And the other one is the Evito uh, with, a, uh, with, with, with a range of 11 hours. For the fixed wing fuel cell, uh, sorry, the next one is the multi-rotor which is the Evito model. And now this is under development. The mileage is about 300 to 500 kilometers with three hour to five hour E range time, uh, duration. That's one. Overall speaking, as you can see here, the features here is that from powertrain, fuselage design, uh, energy management, we've, this is our job from SPIC and we want to make it lightweight. Uh, the Comac trying to make it lightweight and we combine our features into one carriers and we want to make it lightweight. From a hydrogen point of view, from lithium point of view, lithium battery point of view, we try to make all the different components on this uh, carrier to make it lightweight in order to make sure the high end performance. Next year, next, next page. And uh, this is our uh, fuel cell design. Overall speaking, it has very reliable performance. Next page. And this is our new new energy hybrid plane, Lingxue H, uh, with a massive, with a takeoff power of 3000 watts. And we put a lithium battery in it and the designed weight is 28 kilograms with a five kilograms of lithium power or lithium battery and the six to eight kilograms of FCS. And we have already done several tests for this flight. Next one, uh, collaboration with Comac. Like I said before, we start from August, 2018 for fixed wing first and then multi rotor first and then in the future, our goal is to provide service for, uh, provide photography service uh, and also a mobile substation using our flight for Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics. And also we will provide uh, technical support for Beijing 2022 Winter Olympic opening and closing ceremonies with our product. Technical issues, the internet is off. Uh, I think we have a problem here that uh, connection to China somehow has broken. Uh, we wait for one, two, uh, three minutes. Uh, I think maybe he can get on again. Otherwise, I would say we try to um, have our next speaker. Speaker is out. So yeah, so, so we should go to our next speaker. Um, uh, so um, we can close this presentation. Is uh, Mr. Teichmann uh, in the session? Because I tried to reach him by other connections, but I could not reach him because he was supposed to have the last presentation in this session, but requesting for speaking earlier. Uh, Mr. Teichmann, so I see you are there. Could you please, uh, can we unmute Mr. Teichmann and ah! Here we go. Very good. Oh yeah, now it worked. Yeah, uh, very good. Okay, thank you. Then I go into mute again. <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Take, for the invitation. And hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to, to be here today and to speak to you. Um, actually, I want to present my company, Hydrogenius Technologies, and our technology, which is not uh, focusing so much on, on air application at the moment, but which is focusing on hydrogen supply and hydrogen infrastructure, which I learned is also an important topic for you. And therefore, we believe that it might help and be a contribution to your event today to show a bit what we are working on in regard to making large amounts of hydrogen available to um, big consumers and in industry. But of course, it can also be like, for example, to big airports um, and how they can supply hydrogen. Um, and therefore, let me immediately start um, very quickly mentioning um, the background of my company. Um, so Hydrogenius LHC Technologies, we are located in Germany, in Erlangen. We are at the moment uh, seven and a half years old. So 
We are a young company, but not a complete startup anymore. We have a little over 100 employees working for us. Um, we have, as you see on the bottom left, a number of investors um, like AP Ventures, Popa, Covestro, Hyundai, Mitsubishi Corporation. Um, and what we are really working on is making a hydrogen-based energy system a reality by um, giving access to cheap green hydrogen in large quantities. And for that, I mean, I think I don't have to mention anything about hydrogen. I guess you're all aware of why we believe it can play an important role in a future energy system. I mean, it allows for a CO2-free energy cycle, um, splitting water and then recombining it to water. Um, then, and that's, I think, important, we see hydrogen as a chance for really trading renewable energy in large amounts because we have a lot of regions in the world that are perfectly fit, perfectly suited for producing them, like Northern Africa, like the Arabic countries, like Scandinavia for wind power, like Australia. Um, and then, of course, we have look, um, regions like Germany or like Europe where it's not so easy to produce large amounts of renewable energy, and therefore you need to transport and trade renewable energy. And hydrogen can do that because it's a, um, a chemical energy carrier. Um, and that's one of the, that's the second reason why we believe hydrogen needs to be there, needs to be part of the solution. Um, and the third one certainly is that um, there are a number of sectors that are very difficult to decarbonize uh, with only renewable electricity, but which need an, an, a chemical energy carrier like hydrogen. And I mean, one of these applications certainly is, for example, steel production that's mentioned quite, quite often um, in order to reduce your, your, um, your, your steel, you, you can use hydrogen. But of course, transportation sector can also be very interesting in the future. And that's the um, protection from the Hydrogen Council. Um, and transportation involves a lot of heavy duty vehicles, so buses, trucks, trains, ships. And, and I mean, there, I think you're the expert. Um, I believe it can also play a role in, uh, in, in the air industry. Um, and certainly I think this is one of the sectors where hydrogen uh, can play a role. And um, what is Hydrogenius doing? We have developed a technology how to transport and store and handle hydrogen not in a molecular form. I mean, that's the typical way, right? Um, compressing hydrogen to several hundred bars, liquefying it by cooling it down to minus 250. That's the conventional ways of storing hydrogen. What we have developed is a technology to, uh, to store hydrogen in a chemical way by binding it to a liquid carrier molecule, which is actually a heat transfer fluid, um, which can be stored and handled in the existing infrastructure for liquid fuels. Um, so you see like here when a, a plastic tank um, stored at ambient condition that's filled with 1,000 liters of this liquid. Um, and how does that work? It's actually a, a chemical process where hydrogen is being bound to that liquid, to that oil. Um, and then you don't have molecular hydrogen anymore, but you just have the oil that can be transported like every other liquid fuel that you know today, like diesel, like gasoline. So that means you can use road tankers, you can use underground tanks, you can use big ships on the sea, um, and then you transport it to where you need the hydrogen. Um, and that could be a big industry consumer, like a refinery. It could be a big airport, for example, that needs a lot of hydrogen. Um, and then hydrogen is being released from the carrier in another chemical process. Um, and that hydrogen can then be used for, for your application. Um, and the carrier, so the, the oil itself, is not being consumed, but it can be brought back to the site of uh, hydrogen generation and can be reloaded with hydrogen. So it's actually a an, an cycle where you load it with hydrogen, where you transport it to the, to the consumer and where you unload it. Um, and the carrier, the oil, is not consumed, but always goes in these cycles. Um, and that's the LOHC technology. It's, that's actually short for liquid organic hydrogen carrier. Um, that's a technology that's in principle already known for, let's say, 20 years. Um, but we're certainly what we have developed is a, a certain carrier material that we use, um, which is here, which is called dibenzyl toluene and benzyl toluene. Um, and also, of course, what we have developed is really the process technology, how to do these transformations, um, how to store hydrogen within that liquid, and how to unload it. Um, and now the question, of course, is what's really the advantages of that? Why would you? store hydrogen in this chemical way. Um, and there's a number of advantages. The first one is that, as mentioned, you can handle that oil. You see it here. It's really like a mineral oil, if you like. And you can handle that within the existing infrastructure for liquid fuels. 
So no high pressure storage needed, no cryogenic temperatures needed. You can store it in glass bottles, you can store it in plastic tanks, you can store it in, in steel tanks. And that's of course making the whole distribution and handling of hydrogen much easier and also allows the, the introduction of hydrogen um, in, a, in a much more capital efficient way. So that's the one big advantage. The second one is really around um, the hydrogen storage density. So in one uh, cubic meter, we have roughly 57 kilograms of hydrogen stored, so five, seven kilograms, which is um, compared, for example, to pressure storage, quite a, a very high um, storage density. So that means you are able to, to transport rather large amounts of hydrogen um, easily in that form. Um, and the third advantage, that's a, a little video I, I will start here. Um, this is around safety aspects. Because, um, I mean, as mentioned with LOHC, you're not handling molecular hydrogen anymore, um, but you have it stored in, in a chemical way in this carrier oil. And that means, and you see it here, that the, the inflammation um, is, is very difficult or even not possible. So it has a very high point of, of inflammation, much higher, by the way, than uh, diesel, for example. Um, and that, of course, is a completely different story, different picture than, than pure hydrogen. Um, so what you here see here on the right, that's gasoline. So that's, of course, quite expected that it, it burns very easily. Um, and on the left side, you see once again the LOHC, where um, you in the end actually can just um, yeah, uh, extinguish your torch um, without anything happening. Um, and that's not surprising for the technical expert, expert, because I mean, with these molecules, we're talking about hardly flammable um, molecules or materials. But of course, it changes the story of handling hydrogen in large amounts um, quite a bit um, because it reduces um, risks and it also reduces the efforts that you need to take to handle hydrogen in a, in a safe way. Yeah, that's in short um, the LOHC technology. Um, what I also wanted to show here is, is really what we as Hydrogenius are currently doing, what kind of projects we are involved and how we are really working on scaling up a hydrogen infrastructure um, based on our technology. Um, and you see that here for Europe, I mean, uh, as we're coming from Europe, of course, we are in a first step fo focusing on Europe here because, um, because of, uh, it, it helps us. There's a lot of momentum also on the political side um, on hydrogen. Um, and, uh, and of course, we are also interested in the next steps to also move into Asia or, or the United States. But Europe is a good starting point for us. Um, and this picture shows some of our of our projects we are currently involved in. So, for example, we have um, just sent systems to Finland, um, where we have uh, let me go to the no, sorry, um, where we have um, a hydrogen source here in Kokola, um, and then we transport hydrogen to a hydrogen refueling station here in Volkoski. So that's roughly 200 250 kilometers using LOHC using standard road tankers. Um, then we are building up a hydrogen refueling station here in Erlangen, that's our hometown, um, where we use LOHC to supply really large amounts of hydrogen to the station. Um, and as you see here, we use underground tanks. So that's uh, very regular um, liquid fuel underground tanks as they are used today for gasoline or diesel. And we use it for storing LOHC. Um, and by that, we can really supply many tons of hydrogen very easily to the station without needing a lot of these pressure storage, uh, pressure cylinders that you typically see. So that's current projects. And then you see a number of projects here that we develop in terms of upscaling technology. So go, going from, let's say, container size to really industrial sized plants, something like five tons per day, um, 1.5 tons per day. Um, and there um, we, we have um, a number of projects that are developed in, under European funding. Uh, one of them is called here Green Crane, as you see, it's about the import of hydrogen from Spain um, to Rotterdam in the Netherlands using LOHC and using large oil tankers on the sea. So using con conventional oil tankers to, to load them with LOHC. Um, then we have a different, a similar project, which is about import of hydrogen from Eastern Europe via the river Danube, also using river ship transportation and then supplying several industrial chemical companies here um, in Austria and Bavaria. Um, so like big refineries, for example, or a glass manufacturer and so on. Um, and this is really the way we, we try to develop our technology, upscaling it, um, bringing it into large scale, into really industrial scale, supplying large scale industrial consumers with it. Um, and of course, I mentioned it in the beginning, 
in our eyes, instead of a refinery, of course, you could also have an airport here um, where you deliver large amounts of green hydrogen, for example, from Eastern Europe at low costs with high safety in large quantities. And then you could also ex actually use existing infrastructure at the airport. For example, I mean, they have large tanks usually for, for the kerosene, for example. You could also use them for storing LOHC and thereby supplying um, the airport with green hydrogen. Yeah, so that's um, the, the idea. Um, I just wanted to show you like one, um, one, one more slide, um, just as an outlook. Um, I mean, what we are also working on is bringing this LOHC technology onto ships. So for the direct usage as a fuel on board of the ship. So that means you would actually do the release process on the ship. You would then uh, fuel the hydrogen into a fuel cell and thereby create the, the propulsion of that ship. Um, the advantage is that you could again use the existing tanks of the ship that are today used for um, uh, that we could uh, that you could use the existing tanks on the ship that today are used for, for crude oil or diesel or whatever um, and that also you could use very easy existing infrastructure at ports um, where you where you already have tanks and pumps and all of that for liquid fuels available I mean we're not talking not at all about putting that onto an airplane very soon Nevertheless, I mean, for a longer term development roadmap, I think that's something that's also important. And I mean, there are groups also here at the university that work on miniaturization and really making it smaller, making it more energy dense to in the end, bring it also to smaller mobile applications. But for the moment, we are really focusing on the stationary applications as I've shown, and in addition, um, these large scale mobile um, on the maritime sector. presentation of way. All right. Now I think I have already a few minutes more than I was allowed to. So uh, sorry for that. Uh, and of course, if you have any question or if you have time left, happy to answer it. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, very much. And uh, I explain a little bit about why, why I uh, wanted to have him in the session, because when we, you talk with anybody about uh, the hydrogen or fuel cell, it's always the question, yeah, it's very dangerous. It can explode. Or it is you have the problem that uh, you cannot transport it because if you have it in gas form, it uh, it's going through the walls of the gas tank and you lose it because it has to be high pressure. And this could be a solution. And if we solve this problem, then perhaps hydrogen can be much more efficient also in electric aircraft. So thank you very much. And we go to our next speaker, um, uh, Mr. Wei Zhang from uh, CATL, the battery manufacturer. Um, regarding developing a uh, pure uh, lithium ion batteries for uh, a lot of EVITAL applications. Okay, so uh, basically uh, I believe most aircraft designers are uh, aiming for a, a lithium ion battery that uh, would be able to support both um, the high power density requirements from the taking off uh, stage and also the high energy density for longer range uh, for uh, cruising but actually the fact is uh, we we certainly have problems finding like one single cells that you know has the kind of superpower that uh, would be able to deliver both of these uh, performances at, at the same time so uh, my my whole presentation would be based on uh, how we look at this based on our lithium iron product, like how to uh, actually finding the optimum point for uh, a safe and um, a, a safe and a good battery for uh, this kind of application. Uh, next page, please. So basically, if you're looking at the, sorry, I don't have like much um, diverse data to sharing, but. Uh, so these these data are from online, but actually you will be easily tell that um, based on different chemistries on the battery, uh, the actual performance will be uh, very diverse in terms of specific energy and specific power. Uh, something I um, want to mention is yes, conventional um, materials and lithium ion battery we can reach um, 300 uh, watt hours per kg plus, even plus, and uh, I believe uh, most people know that the solid state lithium batteries can do even higher uh, energy density, but the fact is if you're trying to find one battery that has a high um, energy density as well as the 
um, power density, it, it's gonna be very application dependent. And I I believe the um, the trend is if you're gonna if you're gonna have a battery that's gonna have good power performance, uh, definitely the energy density will will become lower because we're gonna put some designs in the cells to satisfy that power uh, demand. Okay, next page, please. So um, let's say we find let's say fortunately we find one cell that actually can do uh, both of the perf performances wise, but. Uh, we no, still want to say that, um, yeah, sure, sure. even we don't want to say that, but the battery is a very active uh, chemistry compound um, system. So uh, we, we have to care the safety because you, you cannot afford any uh, critical failure um, of the battery because that would be like catastrophic for the whole aircraft system. So we'll boil down from the system level to the uh, cell, uh, battery cell level um, to demonstrate our perspective uh, regarding this. Next page. So uh, as a very critical thing about the battery system is the thermal runaway and it's usually triggered by uh, some event overcharging, overheating uh, something that the battery cell doesn't like and it will eventually uh, evolving into a stage of thermal runaway and I believe to um, actually certifying this battery you definitely have to demonstrate that your battery system would be able to um, contain this failure mode and from the design from the perspective of the aircraft uh, there's really nothing much you can do but uh, still you can try to uh, spatially isolate the battery system once it's went uh, thermal runaway. Also, you can put uh, heat resistance material, also like uh, anti-firing material to try to squeeze the the actual effect uh, that the battery will have uh, that that could propagate onto the aircraft system. Okay, next page, please. So also, um, the battery capability. Uh, shouldn't be treated as a constant um, performances because it certainly varies with uh, how you how you're gonna use it. So uh, in just put in mind that when you're using the battery, the at different temperature and at different discharging rate, it's gonna have different performances. And I believe these should be uh, noticed by the uh, aircraft designer, aircraft control designer, and they should. Um, kind of put that, integrate that in their control strategy, uh, either in a software or um, some other ways. Uh, next page, please. Uh, also, the uh, electrical architecture design is very important. Uh, you don't want one, the failure of one single battery that uh, will, you know, causing a disastrous um, effect on your aircraft. So you may consider using multiple battery systems in parallel. Um, also, you uh, should put uh, battery diagnostics, um, like built-in tests, and also it should have really good interaction with the uh, flight control system. Okay, next page, please. So, uh, in terms of the subsystem level, uh, that these requirements should uh, naturally flow down from the system level, and you can see uh, there's already a lot of problems. Um, in terms of, let's say, BMS design, you have to control the battery uh, to operate in a very uh, stringent um, temperature range. Also, you have to know that the power capability of the battery is depending on um, aging, depending on temperature, depending on a lot of things. Also, you have to have an accurate indication of the battery status uh, to the uh, flight controls unit. Next page, next page, please. Um, in terms of the battery pack design, uh, you need to put uh, redundancies in case that uh, any branch, any single components, um, battery cells failed, and you don't want that to ruin the whole batteries. So isolation of the failed branches would be one thing. Um, also, you may consider the switches you're using uh, in terms of reliability, complexity, and also um, other advantages and disadvantages. Okay, next page, please. Okay. 
So uh, in terms of the component level, there's there are also some things we could do as uh, battery suppliers. We could put safety mechanisms inside the battery cells, but of course there's going to be a trade-off. So you might be losing some uh, energy density. You might be uh, you know, change the dimension of the cells. But one thing that you gotta know is uh, the cells' mechanical strength of the cells. Uh, safety boundaries should be carefully designed. And if you are demand, if you are uh, depending on your whole uh, cell safety from a cell suppliers, you you should uh, be able to uh, get all the requirements that you need directly from the aircraft level to the component level so that I'm, I believe this this is the only way the whole system is going to work. I'm not sure okay, if Erwin Digger is in because he... So, so uh, in terms of long-term things, I believe there are, um, uh, there are uh, environmental tasks that you need to perform on the cells uh, that as you can as you can see the the uh, the aging of the cells that will uh, certainly uh, making the cells performances uh, uh, be, uh, became reduced uh, to a level that may not support your flight mission and also you want to do extreme uh, working condition tests uh, including I mean maybe setting off one cells and see if your uh, design contains the failure mode. Uh, also, other failure modes like maybe the BMS is not working. Uh, if your if, if if your cell can if your better system can still uh, handle that condition. Um, next page, please. Okay, so uh, next page, please. Okay, uh, I hope my um, my sh my sharing of my little perspectives can okay, yeah, contribute yeah. to. Uh, Aircraft designer t uh, thinking about uh, certifying a battery toward I don't know DO third DO uh, three one one uh, DO one sixteen G and uh, other considerations regarding designing a, a aircraft uh, battery system for uh, Avital system. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, we know that batteries are important and. For electric aviation, they will stay important, even if other technologies will perhaps uh, get on. Uh, but uh, batteries will, for quite a long time, batteries will be our primary source for developing uh, electric aviation. So our next speaker is a company which in electric has been or has a very big name in electric components. And... Um, this is uh, Erwin Beger from Bosch General Aviation and uh, he'll, Bosch is at the same time, hello Erwin, ah, you're sitting in the car, <laughs> very good. <laughs> uh, this, um, so uh, uh, he will give us an overview what uh, Bosch is doing because Bosch is doing a lot of components and it's yours Erwin. Okay, hello together. So I hope everybody can hear me now. Yes. So I like to give you a short overview about the activity of the Bosch side, um, mainly on automotive based components, what we are doing on the fuel cell concepts and uh, uh, one topic I added, that's what is going on about, let me say, connectivity. Every, every part, every unit is connected today and what are the potential for the future so please the next job so that's the, the overview as i mentioned short overview about bosch and the bosch aviation division uh, specific developments we are working on what is the fuel cell approach within bosch and the future of connectivity so first slide about the bosch itself Bosch is divided in four different divisions. The biggest one is the mobility solution division. It's everything around, around automotive. Then we do have the industrial technology. That's for example, Rexroad, Bosch Rexroad. We have energy or building technology. That's for, let me say, security and all the heating systems Bosch is supplying. And on the right side, the consumer goods. I think that's the famous one, all the grilling machines, washing machine, all these things 
uh, which you use in your household. So Bosch itself has around about 400,000 associates and the sales in 2019 was 78 billion euro. Next slide, please. So what is Bosch offering in uh, aviation? Uh, we formed the aviation entity in 2008 and uh, since 2017 we do have an entity in US as well. So we can serve uh, uh, the whole world with our products. The products are based on existing automotive products and that's our, let me say, slogan. We like yeah, to offer call, potential synergies between automotive and aviation according to the principle of aviation means automotive. We sure. So uh, let's yeah. see how, we, yeah. how the so benefit could be for you. Next slide. These are the products we are supplying today. The first one you see a control unit, which is specific developed based on the aviation, let me say, standards like DO254, DO178. In this case, it's a Dow B system. This is a specific development where we use the Bosch infrastructure also for the whole components which are used in the control unit are sourced through the Bosch infrastructure. The next one are the commercial of the shelf products. These are the standard automotive products which needs uh, to be validated to on aviation something. applications and can be used as is. Mm. We offer also support in electrification, hybrid concepts and let's see perhaps also in fuel cell concepts. Next one. So what are the Bosch are doing on fuel cell concepts? We use the Bosch engineering GmbH, that's a service provider within the Bosch uh, organization. And they are able to do analysis and evaluation for vehicle architecture. They can define a system based on technical and commercial characteristic, characteristics. And they can also prove feasibility on the concept regarding efficiency, durability, response, and start time. So we can support from the component to uh, overall vehicle simulation. Uh, we are working on small electric passenger cars, heavy duty trucks, and let's see perhaps in future on aircraft. Next slide, please. Here you see what's our experience in the past. We are working on fuel cell concepts since 2013. Uh, different approaches you see here. The, let me say the famous one is the Nikola truck, which we prepared the A phase of the uh, Nikola truck with our system. And right now we are working on, uh, let me say, passenger car uh, applications uh, with OEM demos and, uh, let me say, uh, sample components. So we are working over six years now on such projects. The next slide shows you the products we are offering. This one we can skip. Let's go, please get to the next one. So these are the, the portfolio which Boss has around the fuel cells. You see on the left side the components and sensors, on the right side this is everything around the stack. So there is mentioned only for automotive. We do, right now we offer no development on the stack for business outside of automotive. This is explicit for automotive only. On the left side, you see these are, let me say, standard components, as I mentioned before, commercial of the shelf components, like the hydrogen gas injector, the compressor, or sensors like pressure okay. and she air flow sensors. That she can share these her are available like as commercial of the shelf yeah. products and can be used for first, let me say, applications. There's mentioned except the FCCCU uh, because this would be, from my point of view, a specific one. We can see this on the next slide. Next slide. <laughs> next. Please go ahead. Uh, that's okay. the commercial of the shelf. And here you see it's shown here a control unit on automotive uh, base. And 
this one is available with all the function control unit containing key performance feature, complete control algorithm, and diagnostic services. And now, please go next. We can see that's the, the big question. Oh, sorry. This was too fast. Please go one back. That's the question how we can transfer such a control unit, automotive based, to a control unit which would be certifiable, like the DO178 or 254. That's the question. And perhaps we can work based on our control unit, which is already available, but this needs to be analyzed. Next one. So that's the one I mentioned, future of connectivity. Next slide, please. So we see that uh, with, let me say, this data, which is, could, would be available within, uh, let me say, all these control units, uh, we can gain value on quality, on safety, and on performance. And also, we can prevent resources like material, energy, waste, and time as well. The next slide shows you what could be or what could be is possible or which we are working today on automotive. We call it connected cloud services, in this case, a fleet management. That's first on safety and security. You can handle a vehicle tracking, you can a logbook have on this one. And then the next one is reporting. So you can, let me say, the drive, driver or pilot behavior, also accident recording, and you have access to an internet portal. Uh, based on such a system, you need to have a so-called onboard unit on, on the vehicle or the airplane, which is connected by, for example, GPRS. And the last one is a vehicle, vehicle data management, that's, let me say, mainly can be used a new maintenance concept work and you can have uh, uh, data available to, let me say, to have a, a specific maintenance concept based on data which are summarized in this control unit and available for the OEM. Now. So I think that one next slide. Yes. Let's see this one that's at Stuttgart Airport and the aircraft is starting. So let's see what brings us the future. Thank you. Thank you, Erwin. And uh, very interesting, like uh, some years ago when Bosch went to general aviation, um, it took a long time until it was really established. But now in a lot of uh, motors and components in general aviation, we see components from Bosch, like in cars. You, it's hardly to find a car where you don't find Bosch components in, probably. And we see that you really love cars as you're even <laughs> presenting out of a car. Um, our next guest, Erwin, has been presenting at our forums already several times. Forums already several times. Our next guest is fairly new to the eFly forum. Um, it's uh, Professor Agnes Jocha from TU Munich. And uh, yeah, give us an overview of what is going on in the field of electrification. No, not electrification, about new energies and mobility in Germany and Europe. Thank you. Thank you. I will go ahead and share my screen with you. Vaccine? Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, now I cannot see my eye. Here we go. You see the presentation? No? You see my presentation screen? Yes, yeah. we okay, see it on so the screen. Perfect. So I will get started. So welcome to my talk. Um, about uh, indirect use of renewable uh, electricity. That means green hydrogen efforts in Germany and beyond. So uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself a little bit. Um, so I'm rather new, as uh, Mr. Takic has said, at TU Munich. I just joined TU Munich in summer 2020. 
Before that, I studied mechanical engineering here at TU Munich. I did a PhD in combustion technology at RWTH Aachen. I spent some time at the environment branch of ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization in Montreal. And in 20, from 2018 to 2020, I joined the Green Group in the Department of Chemical Engineering at MIT. Um, before joining the German Environment Agency in 2020 and now uh, having my professorship, assistant professorship at TU Munich. Some services I'm on, it's, uh, I'm on the editorial board for Elsevier's Fuel Communications Journal and I'm a nominated expert by Germany for the ICAO CAPE Long-Term Aspirational Goal for CO2 reduction in International Aviation Task Group, or short LTAC TG. My research areas, as mentioned, I'm just building my group. So it's a very initial state. Um, I'm working on improving existing transportation. That means I'm looking into combustion control to reduce soot formation. That is also what I did during my PhD. I want to expand into hydrogen fuels. I'm already working on sustainable aviation fuels and lower carbon aviation fuels. Besides that, I'm also investigating new modes of transportation like the Hyperloop technology. And uh, TU Munich already has a very successful student team um, who won several times the Hyperloop SpaceX competitions uh, featured by Elon Musk in the last couple of years. So as some uh, speakers already alluded to, um, why do we need green hydrogen? I just want to go a little bit more in detail on that, um, especially in Europe, the aviation image in society has suffered in the past years. So there were initiatives like flight shaming or stay grounded that took many people, but especially young ones to the street. And they were demanding from the aviation sector to contribute its share to sustainable development. And for example, um, a good uh, way of doing that would be uh, using the sustainable development agenda by the United Nations for 2030. It includes so-called sustainable development goals, SDGs, that are a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and improve the lives and prospects of everyone and everywhere. So there are 17 goals that were adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015 as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They are not legally binding and they rely on national actions. And the use of renewable electricity could match several goals, but most notably, for example, number seven, the affordable and clean energy goal, number nine, the industry innovation and infrastructure goal, number 11, sustainable cities and communities, number 13, climate action, and hopefully as well, number 17, to form partnerships, for example, with you today to enhance those goals. Also, we have uh, seen that before, but I think it's just a, a nice summary um, to point it out how direct use of renewable energy in batteries, and there's the other category of indirect use of power to molecules that could be either green hydrogen, that means in fuel cells or H2 turbines, but as well as in e-fuels, which are based on green hydrogen plus uh, some source of carbon dioxide, and therefore then uh, are forming synthetic liquid fuels or so-called drop-in fuels that are flying uh, in some flights today for international aviation. On the right-hand side, um, I just want to show you again the different uh, types of hydrogen. It depends on the primary energy source. So we have renewable as primary energy source, for example, from wind and solar, but also from fossil fuels. And currently, today's market share is lower than 2% for renewables, but large, about 98% for fossil fuels. And so still today, average production cost is a lot higher for uh, green hydrogen, which is based on renewables, compared to uh, hydrogen, blue hydrogen that is based on fossil fuels and carbon capture, as well as gray hydrogen that is coming from uh, 
fossil fuels. But with um, increasing market shares of uh, green hydrogen, as well as learning curves, uh, we expect that the average production cost um, that is relatively high today might uh, be a lot more favorable in a decade or so compared to uh, blue or gray hydrogen. In some areas of the world, um, renewable electricity is today sometimes um, even competitive with natural gas-based hydrogen, for example, in countries like Chile, Morocco, or New Zealand, where we have uh, big resources of, of wind and, and solar um, radiation. Uh, the other advantage why we want to use hydrogen was also mentioned before. So the main reason is the gravimetric energy density of hydrogen is uh, rather high compared to um, batteries and therefore allowing for longer ranges or a relatively fast refueling. The German government is uh, so convinced about the advantages of green hydrogen, especially regarding its carbon emission reduction performance, and therefore plans to initiate the hydrogen economy in Germany, as described in the National Hydrogen Strategy of Germany that was adopted in June 2020. It says that about 7 billion euros are allocated to promote green hydrogen production and use to install a capacity of about 5 gigawatts by 2030. In addition, 2 billion euros are allocated for project with international partners, including from emerging and developing economies. The action plan itself includes 38 measures. They are focusing on ramp up and laying the basis for a well-functioning market until 2023. But continuous research and development efforts, as well as international aspects, are um, advanced after that. On the side of the European Union, there was a communication document published in July 2020. It's called a hydrogen strategy for a climate neutral Europe. And there the objective is to install at least 40 gigawatts of renewable hydrogen electrolyzers by 2030 in the European Union. And the production of about 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen in the European Union which might lead to a cumulative investment in renewable hydrogen in Europe up to 180 to 470 billion euros by 2050. So how is my group going to participate in that in two major fields? The first one is um, looking into high combustion efficiency of hydrogen propulsion turbines with especially focus on low NOx emissions and long lifetimes. Um, that means we look into combustion chambers with new designs tailored for hydrogen combustion, looking into lean mix technologies for H2 turbines to reduce NOx emissions, but also looking into cooling system for those high temperature turbine stages. And the second major point is uh, looking into high power lifetime optimized fuel cell systems, including cooling concepts. Um, that means uh, safe and light uh, liquid hydrogen fuel components like double insulated fuel pipes with cryogenic cooling, compressors and heat exchangers, but also into leaking and venting management. So if you're interested in, in working with me and uh, also just looking into uh, different concepts, please contact me. I'm happy to, to meet you and to get into contact. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes, and uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And I think there will be probably quite some questions afterwards. So um, one thing is I would like to remind the speakers in the chat, there are some dedicated questions sometimes right after the presentation. So if you have time, can have a look and maybe answering there, we try we we'll look onto our schedule and try to have a Q&A session um, uh, so that you can uh, get the answers there. We may do a little tryout of a breakout session again. And uh, now I come to my next and last speaker of this session, who actually we swapped what you probably have seen, Florian Hilpert. 
uh, from Fraunhofer Institute, which is a leading German research institute. And uh, he will give us an overview on uh, fuel cells, electric, and the research, what the Fraunhofer Institute has done in this area. So, uh, Florian, if you would come up to the stage, uh, like we normally say when we are in a real yes. presentation. Um, uh, yes, hello. I think ah, you can yes. already hear me. Yes, uh, we hear you and I will go away and then I, we should be able to so oh, if you switch your camera, can you switch your camera on? Yes, uh, I can't because it's blocked by the host. Uh, can you check the camera? Yes, now I can. Yeah, now here we are. Now you should be okay, able to see me. Then I'll leave you the stage and go away. Okay, thank you also uh, from my side uh, for the possibility to um, talk to you all here. Uh, we had great presentations uh, so far, and I want um, to uh, um, draw a light on the field of um, power electronics in fuel cell and battery um, based drivetrains. My name is Florian Hilpert. I'm working in the um, group aviation electronics at one of the uh, 70 Fraunhofer research institutes in Germany. And my institute is based mainly uh, in the field of power electronics and they're from material up to the complete uh, system. For the beginning, I would, uh, next slide please. I would like uh, to stress your uh, fantasy a little bit. Uh, you see here uh, fuel cell uh, long range uh, UAV um, with an electric drivetrain. And do you think it's possible to integrate a 15 kilowatt inverter just in the existing aerodynamic um, tip of the electric motors? And to start, next slide, I would want to show a little video what is happening in the field of power electronics uh, for fuel cell applications at the moment. Hope this works. I also could share my screen to show it. If you share the screen, it would be better because... Uh, okay, we... then I'll share my screen. And I hope you can yes, also you hear the tone. Is it with audio or without audio? I, at the moment, I don't hear audio. No, no, we don't have audio from your side. Um, let me see if I can play the video uh, with the tone because it worked with me with tone before. Okay, I am sorry, yes. Uh, we tried it out and then it worked, but that's like always like this. Ah, uh, yeah, now I can also do it. Okay, good. Click the wrong button, I'm sorry. The coronavirus ah, may have it. slowed things down Stop. in recent times, but the pace of life increases nonetheless. Over the last 30 years, the volume of freight traffic on our roads has doubled, and air traffic has risen by a factor of four. Along with the electric motor, hydrogen-powered drive systems could offer the key to zero emissions mobility, particularly for long-distance transport. Motorsport is showing how this can be done. When we combine oxygen with hydrogen, we create electricity and water. And we have a lot of electricity with this process. If you want to move a load like a truck, the hydrogen is the only solution that we have right now. Sustainable freight transport powered by hydrogen. This is a solution that could soon be racing ahead. Thanks to two researchers from the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Systems and Device Technology, IISB, and their new generation of DC-DC converters. Our DC-DC converter is a vital component for the use of fuel cells to power future vehicles. In developing the converter, our aim was to substantially reduce its size while also making it more efficient. The new converter regulates the voltage coming from the fuel cell at an efficiency of 99%. While rival equipment could weigh more than 100 kilograms, the DC-DC converter from Fraunhofer IISB is a genuine lightweight and a mere 17 kilograms. As such, the researchers have turned conventional wisdom on its head. 
We've devised a switching technology that produces extremely low switching losses. Contrary to received opinion, we've therefore been able to build a converter that is very small, compact and extremely efficient. To understand the increase in power density achieved by the researchers, imagine a power plant compressed to the size of a family home while still delivering the same amount of power. This required further innovations. This not only involved new components for power semiconductor devices, it also required new switching technologies that prevent overvoltages during switching and thereby achieve further significant reductions in switching losses. The converter has already proved itself in endurance tests, including on the racetrack, over a period of 24 hours. Le Mans is very important for new technologies because it's where we test those technology across race cars and at the end we use those type of technology on road cars. In the coming years, this new development from Fraunhofer IISB will pave the way for sustainable mobility on all levels, not only on the racetrack, but also for freight and long distance transport. This way, we can achieve zero emissions transport by 2030 on the road and in the air. Okay, so this was a short video um, to start. Uh, I think I can also just take um, the screen. So, uh, just one comment from your side. Can you see my um, screen again? Then I will just take uh, the presentation. Yes, we see perfectly, Great. it's fine. Okay, so you have already now seen that there is uh, something going on regarding increasing of power density in the field of power electronics. And I want to bring up um, an example that we have, we have heard it uh, today before by, by Joby uh, Aviation, that there are some really giant leaps in, in technology uh, sometimes. And it's not, um, yeah, it's not intuitive where they typically come from. But one thing is, um, if you compare it to the to the cell phone um, development, there was a miniaturization of the primary functions. So the phones get smaller and smaller and until you could hardly even press the buttons. And at some point, suddenly the smartphone happened. This was due to the miniaturization of the primary function. And compared to power electronics, at the moment we are in this transition. They get smaller and smaller. And at some point they get so small that you can enable completely new applications. And of course, aviation applications is one of these um, topics where you can, uh, can now reach um, power densities uh, for drivetrains that haven't been possible um, before. So why is this so important? Starting with where we have been over the last, let's say two decades, uh, automotive applications. We all know electric cars, hybrid electric cars. And what you see here is a very abstract picture of the internal high voltage um, backbone of an electric vehicle. So on the bottom line, you have your electric motors and uh, your battery system. Uh, center line here, you have the uh, electric charger and the connection to the uh, low voltage um, board grid. And on top line, additional connections like, for example, integrating fuel cells and other high power loads like electric air con compressors and so on and all these electric components uh, they have uh, they need to be connected to this high voltage backbone of the electric car and these yellow boxes that you see here they represent power electronic systems so now you get an idea that power electronic systems are really everywhere inside um, your electric drivetrains it's not only about the battery the fuel cell and the electric motor you also need the power electronics to be able to connect these to an overall system. Um, if we compare this um, to aviation applications, of course, one thing changes, it's uh, the challenges for automotive. The main challenge is typically the power to volume ratio and costs, of course. For aviation applications, the challenges look uh, different. You have the power to weight ratio that is uh, the main driver, uh, among with uh, reliability, high voltage isolation, cosmic radiation, and others we have heard before from today, Rolls-Royce, 
um, in the in the chat. Um, great answer there. It's different from automotive applications and aviation applications regarding the safety handling. In automotive, a safe state is just shut your the electronics off. In aviation, of course, this is not a safe state. But nevertheless, the overall picture looks pretty much the same what we see in automotive. So we can take a lot of the lessons that we have learned before um, and can adapt them to the aviation um, sector. Um, Regarding this increasing and in power density uh, that you can uh, get an idea where this is heading at the moment, um, back in 2004, um, there have been power densities around five kilowatt uh, per liter. This was for the Daimler F600 fuel cell test vehicles. And we were quite confident with the power density that has been reached there. Um, but as you already have heard in the, in the um, little film that we have seen, the power densities have increased extremely high. Um, of course, these are research prototypes to try to break world records. Typically, if you add all the EMI uh, filtering and so on, of course, you lose uh, power density again. But this is where you can see what is possible. If you utilize new technologies like silicon carbide or gallium nitride um, technologies um, to increase the power density. Uh, one example regarding um, inverters. This is an uh, example for an inverter for an electric uh, air compressor for a fuel cell. Uh, fuel cells are quite complex um, systems. We have seen it in the presentation from, uh, from Bosch before, how many components you need uh, for uh, fuel cells actually. And one is the air compressor. Um, this is an um, uh, electric uh, motor inverter for high speed air compressors. So high speed means it runs at 120,000 RPMs. Um, so the uh, inverter has to be, has to have a very high switching uh, frequency. And I want to point out one really important thing here regarding power electronics. Here are two power levels uh, stated. Uh, in the automotive racing application where it was designed for, we reach a power of 60 kilowatt at the drive shaft at 900 volts DC uh, voltage. That represents uh, incredible 150 kVA power rating for this um, inverter. But this really utilizes nearly 100% of the blocking um, capabilities of the switching devices. So there are 1,200 volts uh, silicon carbide devices integrate it there. And with um, uh, over voltage while um, switching events, um, this really utilizes all the um, blocking capabilities that these silicon carbide devices have. If you want to bring this uh, into an aviation application where you fly high and you have to consider uh, cosmic radiation, you typically have to decrease the voltage on the DC bus um, to be safe uh, against um, single events um, from cosmic radiation. So you have to lower your DC voltage and then you also, of course, lower the maximum uh, power that you can drive. So really it's important always to consider the overall system um, design for um, choosing power electronics. And so don't think power electronics are like a box that you just buy and integrate in your system. Really design them together with your overall system. And if you do so, my last slide, um, then you can achieve really um, great um, integrated systems. Um, this is the inverter system from the very beginning. So of course it is possible to integrate a 15 kilowatt inverter just in this 15 centimeter uh, diameter um, nose cone um, of the electric motor, including cooling and everything. So there is no water um, that's fed there for cooling. There's no cooling duct, no fan inside. It's just the outer surface um, of the existing housing that is utilized um, for cooling. And the system is also designed in a fail operational um, uh, design logic. So it's not one inverter for one motor, but the motor integrated here in the propeller is a six phase motor with two separated three-phase winding systems. It looks like one motor, but electrically it behaves like two motors. And if you lose um, part of your power electronics or part of your motor, 
um, there are failure scenarios where you can mitigate uh, the failure by switching off half of the motor. Um, so you gain reliability um, on the system level. Um, of course, you cannot uh, collect all failure cases with this specific design. Um, so this really is designed for the overall application. Um, so some of the failure scenarios are mitigated within the drivetrain itself by, for example, switching off half of the power uh, to be able to run the single propeller at half of the uh, power. But the overall safety assessment has to be conducted for the complete system. As you can see here, we have here six propellers. Um, so failure cases were, for example, the integrated DC link capacitor that serves both subsystems um, is prone to a failure. This has to be handled on system level. What I want to show you here is really design your power electronics with the overall system in mind. And if you do so, you are able to achieve extremely compact and extremely um, powerful um, systems. Um, so that's for today. I hope I could give you a short insight in the field of power electronics and their vital uh, role in fuel cell and battery electric drivetrains. And I'm happy uh, to receive uh, questions from your side in the breakout session. How can you get eFly Journal? Just scan the QR code on this page. Or just type in your browser www.eFlyJournal.com journal.com then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying EV tolls and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen like a conventional magazine or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye. Mm -hmm.